time of day is careless. Say careless. careless. Okay, you're looking at, if I'm at my favorite, happiest place on earth, I'm doing that right there. And I got to tell you right now that life can get, and it has been, and I can just feel it. When people get so wound up, wrapped around the axle, everything we've got to fix and deal with and think about and worry over and, you know, and people in our lives and family, and, and it just becomes this thing that just stands up on top of your head. Well, this morning, I'd like for us to get careless. In Matthew 13, 22, he said, Now this is a parable of the seed and the sower. And the first seed went by the wayside. And it was quickly gathered up by the enemy because it had no, it wasn't planted anywhere. Let me go ahead and say this. If you're not planted somewhere, you're easy to pick off. If you don't have any relationships in your life, nobody will notice if you're gone because you haven't, you haven't dug in with anybody else. The second seed went into the stony ground and it sprung up and had showed some fruit, but because there was no depth of soil, after a while when persecutions came along or troubles came along, it withered and died. And so I'm going to tell you some of you right now, you know, the reason that things may be rougher than you think, God's plowing. Can I say, have an amen right there? He's plowing and he's getting your soil deeper so that it doesn't matter what comes next. You're not getting your, your, your nutrients or your uh, nourishment from above you in the air. You're getting it all from the roots and where they're planted. And then he came to this soil and he said, now you receive seed among the thorns. And he who uh, hears the word Everyone that hears the word, the cares, everybody say cares, cares, of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. And here's the problem with this is this is what I see in the church a lot. You know, we're doing the work. We're planting the seed. We're doing everything we're supposed to do, getting the word in. But if we let cares slip into our life, then the very thing we are reading the Bible and spending time in God's presence for is being choked to death so that all we're doing is just got a lot of work and good habits. But the benefit of what we're looking for out of that experience and out of that relationship is being choked to death because we are allowing care in our life. Okay? First Peter 5, 6, and 7 says, Therefore humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that may exalt you in due season. Let me, let me make you understand what humbling means. It doesn't mean that you think less of yourself. It just means you think of yourself less. That you're not thinking about your life and everything is not about you and it's not about your kids and it's not about your job and it's not about our country and it's not about yada, yada, yada. But what I'm doing is I'm putting myself in a position to where I know that I am seated in the heavenlies with Jesus. I am seated in His authority and I have come to realize that I am not in charge of my life as much as I want to think I am, I am not. And I, re- I once again surrender to the Lordship of Jesus. How do I do that? Because I cast all my care upon Him. For He cares for me. He, we have an intercessor. We have a high priest that ever lives to make intercession for us. Right now, this morning, our high priest Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father making intercession for you. He is making a demand on our behalf for whatever need comes up in your life. You know, we're going to read this in a little bit. It says that the Father knows what we have needed before we ask. Then why do we ask? Because that makes the connection between us and the one seated at the throne who's been interceding. Why are we filled with the Holy Spirit? So now the deposit of what we've asked for can be put down in our spirit. And what, how do we manifest it? We call things that be not as though they were. That's how this works. Did you know that? That's how it works. It's not just happenstance or, or you know, that God puts his plan, puts his desire down in your heart, and he wants you to seek him and find it, and then call things that be not as, he were, as though they were by seeking his promise in your words. Jim, by women this morning. I'll tell you the truth. Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 through 9. Before we go any further, I want you to say this with me. I do not have a license to care. Turn to your neighbor and say, you do not have a license to care. If you're caring right now about something, if you're wrapped up and burdened by something in life right now, you're acting illegally as far as the Spirit of God is concerned. And when you, when you break the law, you get the, the whirlwind of that, right? You get the payday. 
So that's not God doing it, it's the devil doing it because you're giving him permission. Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 through 9 says, Be anxious or worried for nothing. And look the word nothing up in the Greek language, and it means nothing. It means if I catch myself worrying, I'm already out of the will of God. I'm already out of the perfect presence, the perfect plan that God has for me. I've already walked outside of it. Because what is worry? Let me tell you what worry is. Worry is believing that the devil can hurt you more than God can help you. That's all it is. I'm chewing on and, 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 and thinking about what the devil can do and the lies he's given and the threat he's given more than what God says in his word. And every time I've ever been in any situation where it's personal, that's exactly what I'm doing. I'm being bombarded. I remember getting a call when we saw Hudson and Anna last night. That's Rob's boy. And, and, her, and they've got a little baby girl now. And I look at them and I remember so vividly when Hudson was born. When Hudson was born, we, we drove down to Tuscaloosa to see them. And the minute Hudson was born and they brought him into the room, they rushed him back inside because something was wrong with his breathing. And we had to leave. And so we left and I'm driving home and I got three small kids. And we get back home and we put them to bed and I'm sitting there. And all I'm thinking of is that Hudson's birthday is right around Christmas. So I'm sitting there in my mind, I'm seeing a little tiny coffin. I'm seeing that Christmas will be earmarked for the rest of our lives because his son, Rob's son died. And I had all this stuff just bombing me. I couldn't even get a coherent sentence. I couldn't even quote the Bible. So I, I pulled out my guitar. And this is after midnight. And I'm sitting there in the, in the living room with my little acoustic. And I'm just singing. And I start just worshiping God. I wasn't making a big racket. Well, all of a sudden... Three little t-shirts come running in the, in the room with me and they start running around the room and dancing to the music I was playing. And I just kept the playing and they kept the praising and the next day I called my brother and he said, you know what? They've released him from anything. There's no, pro- no problem with him. And so I wrote an article and I said, the name of the article is The Dance of Children. That in the midst of all the bad report and all the lies and all the dark garbage, we just begin to sing in the dance of children procured, I believe in my heart, the presence of God. And God worked all over the state with people who were praying because we were able to push back the gates of hell because we didn't believe the lie. Yeah. We let the power of God operate through our praise and we begin to say, God, you're greater to heal than he is. You're, you're stronger to heal than the devil is to kill. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication and thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God and the peace of God. Everybody say, the peace of God. What you're after is the peace of God, not an answer. Satan's greatest trick is to ask questions that you have no answers for. And so what do you do when you don't know the answer? You change the question. What do I know? I know he's good. I know he is merciful. I know that Jesus died for me. And you just keep telling yourself what you do know. Because what we're after is the peace of God. And sometimes to get the peace of God, you have to forfeit the understanding. You have to give up understanding to have the peace of God. Because I'm going to tell you something. When we're sitting in a hospital, when you're sitting in a hospital, and you're sitting there, when Taylor was in, in that bed, and we thought she was going to die, or at worst, at, at best, lose her entire life, and I'm down in that chapel fixed to get arrested. I ain't got any answers to these questions. I'm saying stuff, you know, I'm saying, Lord, I have prayed for people who have had this very thing and seen them healed. And this is my daughter. Nothing. Didn't get an answer. But I was telling, I was telling, I've told this so many times, but that next morning when we were leaving the hospital to go home and change clothes, some guy, some kid that worked at the hospital, when I got there, couldn't get my credit card out and I couldn't, I, you know, those little slots where you can't, I can't ever get them. I can't get my fat fingers in the car to get stuck and I got to open the car door and get out and try to pull the thing out. I'm like, God! I just want to drive right through the arm. You know, dukes of hazard. Well, I reckon he, he didn't see me start all that. But by the time I got up there, he pulled out his car and swiped me. He said, you're good. And I pulled up about 10 feet and I got out and I went out and hugged the boy's neck. I said, you don't know it, but you were Jesus to me today. 
You just let me know that he cares about me in the middle of this. And that's all I needed. I didn't know what was going to happen with Taylor. I didn't know how it was going to turn out. But I felt his presence because somebody just decided to do something nice. And when I was talking about an encounter today, when you're out this week and you had an opportunity to do something nice, you have no idea the impact it's going to have on the life. That boy didn't think anything about that. But Jesus sent him to do that. Okay. Because when you get the peace of God, it will guard your hearts and your minds. Why is this important? Because where do we care in our mind? The battle is always right here between your eyes. The battle of life, all the spiritual warfare you're ever going to do is right here. Satan doesn't have any power over us. He's easy. I've watched him cast out of people and they go running like a scared dog. But the thing that hangs on and lingers is the stuff that I give free rent in my head to stay. Anybody with me today? He goes on to say, finally, my brethren, whatever things are true. Now, here's the thing. If I told my kids to do this, you know, they'd probably obey me for a little bit. Because, you know, daddy said so. I mean to tell everybody in this room right now, daddy is saying to you, I'm not giving you a free license to go, oh, I know what he really meant. No, this is what he really means. That if it's true, noble, just, Pure, lovely, of good report, virtuous, and praiseworthy, you can think on it. If it doesn't match this list, you're not allowed to think about it. You cast it down with your mouth if you have to and say, shut up in Jesus' name. Because if you don't, I don't care how seasoned we all get and how mature, this is the dumbest lie we'll ever believe because adults of God don't make it into heaven. Children of God do. I don't know why I had to say that last part. I thought you, you know what he told us to do? Meditate. Everybody say meditate. Here we go. That ain't what he meant. You know what that word meditate means? You know what, you know why the cow does that? He's got two stomachs. He'll go out there and graze and then he'll swallow it into one stomach and later on when he ain't got anything to do, he'll burp that grass up and chew on it. It's called ruminating. And so what you need to do is meditate on God's stuff. Chew on it. Before you swallow it, chew on it. Ain't that pretty? I love cows. My dad said cows are put on earth to torment man. I believe he's right. One day we worked all day to get this one cow that was going to have a calf. Had, I mean, had a calf. We were trying to get her up and, and wean the calf. Okay. Well, we, I mean, we had a hundred acres, so we had to round this cow up and finally get her around and around the barn. And I, I've got the calf and I'm running with the calf. <laughs> and here's this cow just chasing me down. We finally get her into the barn. And, and as soon as she got into the barn, she broke down every gate and half the side of the barn to get out. And I looked at dad and I said, dad, I can't wait like get older so I can do this every day. Nah, nah, I'm just a, a stu- if y'all had a camera. Romans 10, 17. I know you've heard these scriptures, but I want you to hear them again. Faith, say it with me. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Let's do it again. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Faith does not come from having heard. Faith comes from hearing and hearing. Why is it important that you hear the Word? Because faith is what we're supposed to operate in. Faith is how we access the supernatural. Faith is how we live in the Spirit. Faith is how we obey God. Faith is how we live in union with Jesus. What's the opposite of that? The other side of the corn is this. So then fear comes by hearing and hearing by the lies of the devil. Fear comes by hearing and hearing by the lies of the devil. That's the only two choices that you have. Who are you listening to? I can tell you, it's easy to spot. It's so easy to spot who you're listening to because of the fruit in your life. Are you worried? Are you downtrodden? Are you weary? Are you, are you fearful? You're listening to the wrong voice. Well, but you don't know. I don't care about your circumstances. 
We're not talking about these circumstances. I'm talking about what's going on right here. Because you can't change your circumstances at all until you change this. Amen? Proverbs 23, 7 says, So as he thinks in his heart, so is he. Eat and drink, he says, but his heart is not with him. I mean, I listen, I can spot that all day long. People that like, I know they know the right words to say. Well, the older I get, the more I have been a Christian. I know the right words to say. If you ask me how I'm doing, I know exactly what to say to shut you up and so you won't bother me anymore. I'm going to bless. Oh, praise God, yes. Yeah, my butt's on fire right now, but everything's great, really, yeah. Ain't there? Listen, I know all of you. Every one of you. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> when we quit lying to ourselves, we, people know you're lying to them. Just quit lying to me. If I ask that question, I'm not here. Look, like I got better things to do than to sit around and worry about your problems, right? No, really, when I ask you, it's because I feel like there's something wrong. And, and, and when you say, oh, I'm just fine. I'm just really great. Praise God. Hallelujah. Just thank God for the journey. Um, then you make me feel like an idiot for invading your space in all the while. How many times, I can't tell you how many times I've stood up in a service and I have a word of knowledge and I go, somebody's here that they've got a fleck on their left eye. There's, there's something sticking out of their eyelid. And then after the service, the guy comes up. I, it was me. I, you were talking about me, but I just... Uh, I said, why didn't you come forward? What do you think that was for? It's not like there's everybody in the room has something sticking in their eye. And you're just thinking maybe the other people that have it sticking in their eye first will go forward. No, it's all about you. It's for you. And when you deny that opportunity, then you shut the whole process down. Y'all hear me this morning? Yes, sir. So here's the thing. As I think in my heart, I like King James because it says he thinketh in his heart. Because sometimes my thinketh thing is stinketh thing. Okay. In Matthew 12, 34, it said, Brood of vipers, how can you being evil speak good things for out of the abundance, out of the abundance, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. You know what's coming out of your mouth? It's what's in your heart. You know what's getting in your heart? What you're thinking of. What you're meditating on. What are you ruminating? What, are you, what have you finally swallowed and declared by your thoughts and actions that this has got to be true because the guy with the white coat said it? This has got to be true because somebody wearing a tie said it to me. No, none of it has to be true. The truth is what's in that book. The truth is what God says. Not some guy that cheated on his final exam and still made it through med school. And I used to go to school with him, so don't tell me nothing about it. Psalm 118.6 said, The Lord is on. Oh, come on, my gosh. I'd be bragging about this every day. When you, I'd be walking through town going, you know, I just want everybody to know here, the Lord God Almighty that made the heavens and the earth, that is king of all the universe, is on my side. Thank you very much. What is the reason I say that? Because it gives me the ability to say the next thing. I will not fear. When you say the word will in any sentence, it means that there's a, there's a will it has to be adjusted. My will, what I will allow. It's kind of like that. You're talking about willpower. Well, human willpower is useless, but being empowered by the Holy Spirit to do the will of the Father is what we're walking in and what we need to be walking in. So say it with me. I will not fear. What can man do to me? What are you afraid of? Everything you're afraid of is something that belongs in the flesh. What's the worst thing that can happen? You can die. You're going, I hate to break it to everybody in the room. Brace yourself. But if Jesus doesn't come back, we're all going to die. I don't care how many plastic surgeries. I don't care how many you know, IV liquids or cryo freezing. Whatever. We're all going to die at some point. So let's go ahead and settle that and go ahead and give our life to Jesus and be crucified with Christ. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live, I get live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Then I'll get my dying out of the way. So that once that Jesus died once for every man, I'm already dead. Now what you got, Satan? Well, love the will of the all you got left is fear. And if I don't buy it, I don't have to live my life that way. 
Psalm 34, 18 says, The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart and saves such as have a contrite heart. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of, say it with me, them all. Now I heard Pastor Keith, did anybody else say that? But the Lord delivers them out of them all. You're getting delivered whether it looks like it or not. You're going to get free whether it looks like it's going to happen or not. Because you know what? who decides that? You. Romans 8, 35 and 39 through 39 said, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, senility in the White House? Can any of these things separate us from the love of God? Well, I'm doing the economy, the Wall Street, COVID. You name it. What have we been afraid of? What has occupied our thinking for so long and so many years in our, our waking days? How many times do we spend a day thinking about heaven? Well, how beautiful it is and how wonderful it is and that we're one heartbeat away. We're worried about things that may not even ever show up. But the fear of it, the impending doom, is enough to keep my intestines in a knot. All right. I guess I'm at the wrong place this morning. Oh, that's good, As it is written, for your sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. And the King James says no. I should have put that. It says no. We're not counted as sheep for the slaughter. We're not, you know, we're persecuted, but we're not counted as dead already. He didn't leave us down here at the mercy of our enemy to beat us up. What he wants us to say, that in all things, I am more than a conqueror through him who loved me. Say that with me. I am more than a conqueror through him who loved me. What that says to me is no matter what the battle is, I may look like I'm, uh, uh, I may be losing at halftime, but we're winning before it's over with. I'd have a, that was a mic drop moment, but I, these are too expensive. He says this, for I'm, y'all still with me, wake up now. For I'm persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor power, things present, or things to come, nor height, nor depth, or any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus Lord. Can you tell me one thing in your life right now that's negative that can break through that barrier? Can you tell me one exception that you're dealing with right now that doesn't fit in this category? Everything that you're dealing with is something God created and he's already got dominion over it. So you know what? Since you're already related to the author and the finisher, I think we can set this one out. Psalm 37, 25 says, I've been young and now I'm old. In the 40 years I've known him, He's never been late. When I was a young kid, and now as an old man, I can honestly tell you, he's worth the investment. He has kept us all these years. It just dawned on me. I mean, Susie got up to pray for me, and I appreciate her praying for me. But I thought I did, immediately I was transformed back to when we were right over here. We had a we had a little bar set up with a Kool Aid pitcher, of Kool Aid, and a jar, a tip jar. We needed a hundred dollars a month to to pay the rent. We couldn't even raise that. But every weekend and every Tuesday night, we'd have teenagers, kids coming in here, find out about Jesus, getting baptized in the Holy Spirit, and getting devils cast out. I mean, it was just wild. One night I'm standing right here where Johnny is. There used to be a little stage and, and uh, this whole group of people I'd never seen before came in. And I mean, they packed it out. And it was one of those deals to where I half the times you call a band to come perform, they wouldn't show up. So I'd always have my guitar and I'd play some worship songs and play some praise songs and I'd share the Bible. And, and then I'd pray for people. And it was so funny because I'll never forget this one guy he was standing about where Kim's sitting by that pole, and he was kind of, he was kind of anchoring himself to it. I don't know what he heard, but I started walking toward him. 
And his eyes got real big. He had a real big beard and just be, he looked like a, he looked like a, a werewolf kind of staring at me. And he wasn't taking his eyes off me. And I went to lay hands on him and he kept backing up and finally his eyes rolled back in his head and he just went boom. And when he did, that whole row went boom. And I'm thinking back how God has moved and done and always been faithful to do everything He said He's going to do. We couldn't raise a hundred bucks. Y'all got time for this? Yeah. We couldn't raise a hundred dollars. And so the people that owned this, these buildings, uh, the guy that, uh, that owned them was, was a Mr. Long and he had a verbal contract with Rob and Ron. And, uh, which, you know, this is far I got here. I'd have had it in scrawled and granite, but, uh, well, the guy dies overnight. And suddenly his daughters hate us. They were trying to sell the building out from underneath us. I mean, they just, they just almost like their head would spin around when I'm talking to them. So I found out what the building was, was appraised at. And I made a bid at the appraised value. $20,000. <laughs> I mean, it might as well have been 20 gazillion dollars. Because we couldn't make hundred dollars a month in rent, and but twenty thousand dollars, and I had I had just a, a short time to make the 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 money before the, you know I'm, I'm on the hook for. It. So we did this big concert, trying to raise money, and everybody told me this coming didn't come, and and I spent three thousand dollars putting on the concert. Well, before the concert was over. We were that night, the night before we were out there on the field praying and somebody walks up and I can see their headlights and they come off and they're walking across the field. And when I saw them coming, I thought, Oh gosh, they're going to, they're just going to, I just don't even talk to them because they're going to give me the, the third degree of the fact that I've spent money to make money. And sure enough, here they come. What are you doing out here? None of your business. I told him about the whole thing and, and I said, so we're praying over this big concert. He said, no, well, let me get this straight. You need this amount of money and you've spent, you've earned, you're spending money? I said, yeah, that's what we're doing. He said, well, good luck. Pat me on the back and went and got back in his car and I walked and watched him walk across the football field, get in his car and the lights came on and he backed up and then I saw him pull back in. The lights go off. He gets out and walks out there and he hands me a check for a thousand dollars. The next day, we had the concert. We didn't do anything. We had so many people. Gal uh, Galilee uh, was there with Pastor Cameron. It was so hot. We had bands coming in playing all day and, uh, and just didn't have the turnout. But we took the money, we put it in a shoebox, and my brother Rob was supposed to count it. That was probably our first mistake. But, uh, <laughs> but Rob told me, he said, he said, Charlie, I don't believe this, but every time I count it, It's more money. Amen. And it kept going up. I'm talking about thousands of dollars. Kind of like those five loaves and two fishes, right? And I said, okay, so by the end of the day, we were still 3,000 short. But because we did that, these little checks started coming in, 50 and 100, 25. And by the time I got to work on Monday, I called the, our secretary and she said, well, we're still $150 short. I said, I'll cover it. And by the time I could get home, a check for $150 came in and it was covered to the, $6 to the good. And God just showed me. He said, you know what? I don't need, it didn't need to be there before today. So why bring it to you early? You might lose it. Rob might start counting and it start going down. You never know. And I've been young, and I watched him do so many things. That when you think on those things, whatever is trying to get itself inside your head. I stood there the next year and did the same thing, and there was there was thunderstorms all around us. I got people that, that were there that'll tell you this. We had storms growing all over us, and I stood up on that stage and we said, in the name of Jesus. Open up over our heads so it won't rain on us. And, and they'll tell you that the blue sky appeared above that field and stayed there all day long. Now don't, you can tell me I'm a liar, but I was there. Because he's faithful. 
Because he'll do whatever we want him to do. But we've got to believe him for it. When I was younger, I didn't have so much experience fighting me saying, well, but it didn't work there. Well, it didn't work there. Well, it didn't work there. We need to throw all that stuff away and say, you know what? If he's ever done it once, he's going to do it again. Because I have been young and I am now old and I have yet to see the righteous forsaken. Nor are their descendants begging bread. And finally, he says to us in Matthew 6, he says, Therefore, do not worry, saying. Do not worry, saying. The minute you say it, you make it happen. That's how it works in the kingdom. The words of our mouth. And when you keep saying what's wrong, you keep saying the problem. I'm really a stickler about this, and y'all may not care, but I don't like for somebody to say my cancer. If it's your cancer, then you can take it home with you, but it doesn't belong to you. There's none of it in heaven, so I know you didn't get it from God. So quit calling it my cancer. Just call it cancer. Call it whatever that name is that we know there's a name above. My arthritis, my whatever it is. If you put a personal pronoun on it, you've just, you've just owned it. And so I'm not going to take the, I'm not going to worry by saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For after these things, the godless seek. For your heavenly father knows that you need these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Would you bow your head? I'm going to make this really quick. If you're in this room and you'd like to say this morning, I've been caring for stuff. I have care in my heart. I've been worried, troubled. I've been almost sickened by some things. And I'm just choosing today is the day I'm getting rid of all that care. And I'm going to walk out of here free, not burdened and not broken down by the things that I can't rectify. I can't make right in my life. I'm going to let it all go. I'm going to let you have it. And if the devil tries to bring it back, I'm going to say it doesn't live here anymore. You got to take that back home with you because it doesn't belong to me. I've given that to Jesus. Anybody want to raise a hand with me? Let's just pray together. All over the house. Just lift it up. Lift it up. Lift it up. Thank you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Right now, Lord, we just declare. Come on, y'all stand with me. We'll go out of here doing it together. Good day today, right? Good day today, right? Huh? Come on. Good day. Hallelujah. I'm getting careless, God. I'm, I'm designed to be careless right now. I thank you, Lord, that I cast this upon you. I'm not going to carry it around or worry about it or ruminate and chew on it. I'm going to hear what you have to say. I'm going to do what you have to say. I'm going to take guard of, over my thoughts. I'm going to put a guard over my heart. And if it's not praiseworthy, and if it's not a good report, if it's not virtuous, if it's not true, everything on that list, Lord, it's got to pass the test for me to spend time with it. It's got to pass the test before I let it go into my mind. And I thank you, Lord God. I dump it all out. And right now we just, let's do it together. Father, we repent of caring because it's not our job. We repent of being worried. We repent of being fearful because it's not our job. My job is to live in your presence, to manifest the peace from the Prince of Peace, that that is my goal, to walk in peace, to not walk in fear. So Lord, I curse fear. I curse worry. And I thank you that this is the day The Lord has made, I will rejoice and be glad in it. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Get out of here and have a good day.